John 14, if you will, please. Any goodbyes to close friends recently? We did. My wife and I uh, said goodbye to some friends. Difficult, isn't it? It tears your heart out. Well, John 14 is really Jesus' goodbye. It's his farewell to his 12 disciples. He's informing them that he's going to go away for a while, but he's not going to be going for good. In fact, I might say that John 14 is the strangest goodbye that was ever spoken. Because what Jesus says in this chapter is, I'm going away, but I'm also staying. Doesn't seem to make sense. But here's what he means. Though he was leaving them, he would still be present with them. Literally, but not physical, but spiritually present with them through his Holy Spirit. And so I've divided chapter 14 into two parts, very simply, where Jesus says, I'm going, the first 14 verses. And then the rest of the chapter, beginning with verse 15 to the end, I'm staying. I'm going, I'm staying. And I want to look at that as we begin with verse 1 of John 14. You know this verse, let not your heart be troubled, he says. And what he means by that is it's going to tear you up inside that I'm leaving, that I'm saying that the time that you are spending with me physically is coming to an end. That word troubled means to be stirred up inside, to be torn apart. Uh, It's used to speak of you being intimidated or afraid or anxious, or panic-stricken. He says, don't let your heart fall into that category. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be filled with fear. Don't be filled with intimidation. Don't be filled with anxiety. Let not your heart be troubled. And here is why. You believe in God. There is the cure. For anxiety. It is absolute trust in, it is complete dependence upon God. It's simple as far as understanding it. It's difficult to apply it. But if we don't apply it, our lives go nowhere as Christians. Let not your heart be troubled. I'm going away, he says. I think before we get any farther into this passage, To understand the first three verses, we really have to have an understanding of Jewish marriage customs in the first century. And so I'll share that with you after we pause a moment and pray, all right? Thank you, Father, that we can be together again this morning. And thank you for this, these words. They're comforting words. They're very encouraging words, even though they're a farewell address. They're a goodbye. And yet, Lord, you're not really leaving. And I thank you that you have remained faithful, not only to the 12, but you've remained faithful to your people down through the centuries and even to this moment. And so we we praise you for that. We ask that you might right now open the eyes of our understanding, illuminate us. And Spirit of God, you're able to speak this truth that you want us to get today to our our individual need, to our personal heart. And I pray to that end. I want you, Lord Jesus, to manifest your presence with us today, just as you say you will do in this chapter. May it become a reality to us, we ask it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me tell you a little bit about the first century Jewish marriage custom. Here's what would happen when uh, it was an arranged marriage. Uh, It was two families, and a father and a son would uh, make a little trip, perhaps across town, to the home of the prospective bride, 
and the father and the son would sit down with that, the bride's father and they would negotiate a dowry. They would negotiate the price that uh, they would have to pay for this man to have uh, that man's daughter uh, in marriage. When that was negotiated, then the bride price was paid. And there was a covenant that was established in fact, there were also, in, the, in every covenant in ancient times, it involved the killing of an animal, of an innocent animal and blood being shed. They would uh, establish that covenant, and at that moment, at that very moment, that young woman and that young man were considered to be man and wife. However, the young man and his father would leave the bride's home and they would go back to their home and it would be the responsibility of this young bridegroom to add on to his father's house a bridal chamber for his wife and usually that period of time would be about one year at the end of that year that bridegroom and his uh, his groomsmen would make a parade across town to the home of the bride and there would be a shout and the uh, bride and her bridesmaid would come out of her father's house and they would join the groom and his groomsmen and they would parade back across town to the groom's father's house where there would be wedding guests waiting in the courtyard there and they would then celebrate a wedding for seven days. And during that seven day wedding feast, there would be an opportunity for the new uh, groom and his bride to enter into that bridal chamber and physically consummate the marriage. And then afterwards, there would be much rejoicing. This is the picture that we have in the first three verses of, uh, especially verses two and three of John chapter 14. It's Jesus and he is the bridegroom and his people are the bride. And he says, if you'll note in this second verse, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And so this is what Jesus is saying. I'm going to, I want to marry you. I love you. I want you to be my, my bride. I'm going to prepare a place for you where you and I can dwell together forever. Now, I want you to know where that is, according to these verses 2 and 3. He says, I'm going to go to my father. By the way, 53 times in chapter 13 to 17, you'll find Jesus referring to his father. He says, I'm going to go to my father's house. And his father's house is what sometimes is called heaven. In the book of Revelation, it's called the New Jerusalem. And in Revelation chapter 21, heaven or the new Jerusalem is actually a city. And it is a city designed by God that is in the shape of a cube. It is 1,400 miles in four dimensions, including the top, the height. And uh, it is a city that mathematicians have figured out based upon the dimensions if only 25% of that city was utilized, it would accommodate very easily with much room to spare 20 billion people. So heaven is, uh, there's plenty of room. He says, I'm going to my father's house and I'm gonna prepare a place for you there. And really what we have when Jesus leaves this earth in what is called the ascension, and goes back to his father's house, heaven, until he comes back, as he says he's going to, 
which we know to be the rapture of the church, which takes place just prior to the beginning of what is called the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year period, that, uh, that 70th week of Daniel, just prior to that 70th week, Jesus is going to return for his bride. He's going to claim his bride, the church. And so the New Testament church age begins with the ascension of Jesus and the descent of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost that forms or births the church and then ends when Jesus returns as what is called the rapture. And this is the only reference in all of the Gospels to the rapture, this one alone. And so Jesus, I'm glad, gave this teaching and defined for us the fact that you don't have to worry, no matter how bad it gets. Let not your heart be troubled. And uh, just for your information, I'm coming back for you. But not only that, in one sense, I'm never going to leave you. We're going to see that in a moment. So that's where he's going. I said the first 14 verses are about Jesus saying, I'm going. That's where he's going. Why is he going? In again, verses two and three, he's going to prepare a place in uh, a place in heaven for believers. You know, I mentioned that in the first century, a bridegroom, he would take about a year to simply add an addition onto his father's existing house. And uh, families in those days lived in what was called insulas. Mm -hmm. And it was simply an extension of the main house. Uh, sons would build on to their father's house, and then they would occupy what they had built on to their father's house with their family. And uh, there, of course, would be that courtyard uh, that uh, they all could uh, fellowship in as well. Well, that's the picture here, that he is going to build, and he calls it, he says, in my father's house are many, are, are many mansions. Now, let me, I, I like the way the King James pictures that, because we picture, you know, these palatial, uh, huge buildings. But I want to point out something to you, not to diminish the word mansions, but in verse 23, where Jesus says, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. See the word abode in verse 23? Well, the word abode and the word mansions in uh, the second verse are exactly the same word. Why am I saying that? Because I want you to understand that mansion simply means abiding places. It may be large, I don't know, but it is abiding places and that's how you need to view this. Now, that's where, that's why he's going, but what's the way? in which he is going. Well, you pick it up in the fourth verse of this chapter. And uh, Jesus says to them, and where I go, you know the way. And right then there's an interruption by the disciple Thomas. And he says in verse five, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how in the world can we know the way you're going? Here is really a deeper question than where he's going. Philip is, or rather Thomas is coming to the Lord and he's saying, what's the way? Look at Jesus' answer, probably one of the more famous verses in the Gospel of John, right? Verse six, Jesus says, I am the way. In other words, the way is not just something, it's someone. The way is Jesus himself. This is very important. You come to the Father's house. You come to the New Jerusalem. You get to heaven one way. You remember 
back during the, well, maybe you don't, but I do. I was a teenager during the Jesus movement. And one of their, one of their favorite expressions was to hold up a, one finger like this. And it meant one way, one way to Jesus. And it was based upon this verse. Jesus is the one way. He is the one and the only way to heaven. And you come through Jesus. By that, it means you depend upon what Jesus has done for you on that tree because of who he is. What Jesus did on that cross is only valuable because Jesus is the Son of God. Because Jesus alone could pay the human debt of sin. And so he's the way because you come through him, depending upon what he did for you on that cross, he fully paid for your sins, and thus he saves. And you can personally, experientially know him. Because as we read on in these verses, his words and his works define who he is. Look at verse 7. Jesus is, is really rebuking uh, Thomas. He says, Thomas, if ye had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Then Philip chimes in, and Philip doesn't get it either. And, and Philip says, Lord, we should know the father. Just show us the father, and that would be enough. Jesus said, and again, a rebuke to Philip. Have I been so long time with you? And yet you haven't known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So why are you saying, show us the Father? You've seen me, and so you've seen the Father. Believest not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I didn't get them for myself. The Father gave me those words. I'm, I've been speaking to you the Father's words. That's what he means. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The words I speak, the Father that dwelleth in me, he's the one that gave me those words, and the works that I do, the miracles that I do, he's the one that does the miracles through me. That's what he's saying in that 10th verse. And so in verse 11, he says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake, because, again, the Father enabled me to do them. You should know me, the Father, you should know the Father because the Father is revealed through the words that I speak and the works that I do. He's directed my works. I've depended upon him through his spirit. And then look at this. This is startling in verse 12. He says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, now remember what believeth means. It means to depend upon him. It doesn't just mean to believe up here. It means to choose to place your dependence upon him. It's an act of your will. He says, he that depends on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Why? because I go to my Father. I'm going to sit on the throne. And whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Look at the works here. It's not the works of, of Jesus, but it's the works of Jesus through us. It's our works. It's Jesus working through us by his Spirit. He says, because I go to my Father. Now, you have to understand the authority that is Jesus's after he has, in obedience, died on that cross, been buried, then rose again from the dead, and then 40 days later, he ascends to heaven, and he's sitting now on the throne of God. He's sitting on that right hand, that place of honor, in heaven. 
right hand of the Father. And so with that authority, he says, I am going to enable you to do greater works than are recorded in the Gospels that I have done. And one of the first examples of that is in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, a preacher preached. His name was Peter. You know that guy that denies the Lord three times? And the Lord in John 21 comes along and restores him and says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and he simply preaches the word of God in, in explanation of what is this miraculous speaking in languages that were not previously known to these people. How is this happening? And Peter gives an explanation. And as a result of Peter's message, 3,000 people are born again at that moment. That is greater works. You don't have any of that happening in Jesus' preaching ministry. You don't see anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus preaches the gospel of the kingdom, for example, and 3,000 people respond. Now, that, that may have happened, but it's not recorded in the Gospels. And so greater things than these shall you do. And then think about how the work of the Lord expanded from the day of Pentecost. And it went to, from Jerusalem to all Judea to the neighboring country of Samaria. And then very quickly in the early uh, uh, decades of that uh, century, it went worldwide over the whole Roman Empire. Greater works than these shall you do. And I think it's really both physical as well as spiritual power and miracles that uh, these were given the ability to do. And I think there's application to us, obviously, as well, because we have seen the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God, not uh, that began on the day of Pentecost, but has continued throughout church history. In fact, we can expect another outpouring of the Spirit based upon Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, because he says this is something that is promised to everyone to whom the Lord our God shall call that are alive in these last days that we call the New Testament age until Jesus comes. Greater works than these. Notice how they are accomplished in verses 13 and 14 very clearly. They are the result of supernatural enablement of the Holy Spirit based upon prayer based upon asking and receiving. Notice, if you ask anything in my name, that is on the behalf of Jesus, for his sake, not for our sake, not because we want it, but because this is what Jesus wants on his behalf. That's what it means to ask in his name. And really, it's, it, it's Trinitarian prayer. You know what the Trinity is? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know what prayer is? It's praying to the Father, and it is praying through the Son on the Son's behalf that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray to the Father on the Son's behalf through the help of the Holy Spirit. That's Trinitarian praying. And that's really what he's talking about here. So, so far, we found out Jesus is going. But, as I said, this is a strange goodbye. Because while he says he's going... He also says, I'm staying. And so let's pick it up in verse 15. And here's what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. And by the way, what are the commandments? Well, the New Testament uh, uh, church, I could Jesus boiled it down for us. He says, love God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So it's, it's basically one word, love. We're to love God, we're to love others. And, but he says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. Remember what he said in John 13, 34, last week we looked at it. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. So here's the commandments. Love God, love one another. And he says, and, and uh, I'll pray the Father, verse 16, and he'll give you another comforter. 
that he may abide with you forever. Who is that? Verse 17, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. By the way, the Holy Spirit was already at work. The Holy Spirit was already dwelling with God's people long before Pentecost, throughout all human history. The Holy Spirit, he is dwelling with you, but here's the key in that uh, 17 verse, soon, soon he's going to be in you, and it's going to be a permanent residence. And that that's uh, what he said. So he's going, Jesus is, but he's also staying. How's he staying? Because he's sending whom he calls the comforter. The word comforter is a word that simply means helper. I'm going to have someone come alongside you and be your helper in my place as my substitute. Sidebar, incidental. You know, the Roman Catholic Church calls the Pope the vicar or the substitute of Christ. He's an imposter. The one who is the true vicar or substitute of Christ is the comforter, is the Holy Spirit. By Jesus' own admission here, by his own words. Notice again that 17th verse, he says, uh, or 16th verse, I'm going to pray the Father. He'll give you, see the word another? There are two words in the original language that are translated in our English version another. One is a word that means another of a different kind, but the word used here means another of the same kind which means I'm going to send you someone just like me. I'm going to send you a helper like me, which also implies this. The way you treat the Holy Spirit is the way you treat Jesus. If you neglect the Holy Spirit, you neglect Jesus. If the Holy Spirit is just uh, some energy or force that you look to and not a person, then that's really how you treat Jesus, because he's just like me, is what Jesus is saying here. He's here on, uh, on my behalf. Interesting. Well, now he gets into how can a, a believer, how can we be able to live when Jesus is physically absent from us? Well, very simply, we learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit to enable us to keep his commandments. He says in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Hey, can you do that? Have you been 100% successful in keeping his commandments? No human being can do that. So he's sending us the enabler. He's sending us our helper. And the helper, the Holy Spirit of God, when Jesus is physically absent from us, we depend upon the Holy Spirit to enable us to keep Jesus' commandments. And you know what he does? Spirit-produced fruit begins to spring out of our life. And the first fruit, verses 18 to 24, is the fruit of the Spirit that is called love. It's love. Let's pick it up in verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. By the way, that word comfortless, I will not leave you as orphans. Maybe there are people here that you were orphaned uh, as a child. And orphans are often unwanted and unloved. And Jesus says, I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you unwanted and unloved. I'm going to send my helper in my place, the Holy Spirit, and uh, he's going to enable you to experience my Father's love. How? Let's read on. He says in verse 19, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. How can believers experience God's love? Three ways. In verse 19, 
we can experience God's love in the future. When he's talking about the resurrection there, because I live, you shall also live. There's a, some have said, there's a great getting up morning awaiting believers. Dead believers, bodies that are dead, are going to be put back together and brought to life and are going to be joined with their human soul and spirit. They're going to enjoy the love of God in a new resurrection body. That's one way in the future. But notice he said in verse 19, you see me. Even though I'm going away, you see me. And I think he's not merely talking about the future resurrection, but I think he's talking about now, and I'll make that to clear how in a moment. In verse 20, he says, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. That day it is the day when Jesus is glorified that he talked about in uh, verse 12 when he says, I'm going to my Father in that day. In that day, he poured out his spirit upon the church and birthed it. In that day, he says, at that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father. And so I believe that the experience of the love of the Father, the love of God, not only happens in the future at the resurrection, but happened on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to indwell the hearts of God's people. But then look, look what happens after that. He says in verse 21 and 22, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Judas, uh, not Iscariot, but uh, the other Judas and the disciples, he said, how are you going to reveal yourself to us, manifest yourself to us, and not to the world? In other words, he's thinking he's going to show himself physically, and, and Jesus isn't talking about a physical manifestation. Verse 23, he answers his question. If a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. He's talking about the fact that right now you can experience the love of God in your life through the Holy Spirit that lives in you. It's the difference between the omnipresence, the permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God in the Christian or the, the presence of God everywhere in the world versus the manifest presence of God in your individual heart and life. God promises here to continually make his presence real to you, known to you. It's what Jesus talked about in John 10. It's called life more abundantly. And really, it's, it's the bottom line cure for a troubled heart. That the presence of God is so real to you that it drives out all fear. That it drives away all agitation. That it takes care of all intimidation. That God's presence is real to you. Now, as I mentioned, the word mansions in verse 2 and the word abode in verse 23 are the same word. And if you look at it that way, what he says here is, my father and I will come and will make your soul our mansion. Not only is the Savior preparing mansions, so to speak, abiding places for his people in the New Jerusalem, but the Father and the Son are making our very hearts his mansions, his abiding place, his abode, as it's called in that 23rd verse. Then let's pick up in verse 25 through verse 27. 
these things have I spoken unto you, yet being present with you. But the Comforter, we know who that is, right? The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That is a wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit. He enlightens the believer's heart. He gives us understanding. It's a special Holy Spirit anointing that is promised to God's people. That's what 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 27 is all about. There is a special Holy Spirit anointing for understanding spiritual truth recorded in God's word. Have you ever taken advantage of it? Have you claimed it as a believer? Because that's his ministry to us. He'll teach you all things. He'll bring it all to your remembrance, which I've said unto you. And it's not just the apostles. It's you. It's me. We have a wonderful teacher. He's a wonderful teacher, the Holy Spirit, because he wrote the book. It's like you can go right to the author and get his mind and understanding. What do you mean by that? You really want to know? He'll show you. And it's an amazing thing. But uh, let's go on. Verse 27. Jesus says, I'm going, I'm going, I'm yet present with you, but I'm going. And here's what I want to tell you. I'm going to leave you with something. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. Oh, that's nice. Again, back during the, the days of the Jesus movement, there was a bunch of, uh, a bunch of those Jesus movement people that got saved were formerly hippies. And they would go around, peace, right? They'd put up two fingers, peace, peace. Oh, that's the world's peace. And the world's peace is based upon resources that the world can provide. And when those resources aren't available, then peace is gone. Okay? But he says very clearly in verse 27, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives peace, give I unto you. That's why he can repeat again, let not your heart be troubled. The world's peace is based upon its resources. But Jesus' peace is based upon a right relationship with him. And thus, Jesus' peace is there despite any circumstances that might be negative. Any people that might be negative, any things that you might not have, you can still have Jesus' peace. You can face trouble without being troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You'll have his peace in, instead of it. Now, compare what Jesus says in John uh, 14, 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He's not saying, uh, believe in God plus believe in me. In other words, I'm not God. It's not what he's saying. He's saying, believe in me just like you believe in God, the Father. In verse 28, it may be a little confusing. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. He said that in verses uh, 2 and 3. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto my Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now, wait a minute. What is Jesus saying about himself? Well, when you compare verse 1 with verse 28, my father is greater than I, Jesus is talking about himself as one who has come in a human body, one who has taken upon himself a sinless, nevertheless, a human nature. Jesus is talking about himself as God who has voluntarily limited, limited himself in a human body and set aside, listen to me, the independent exercise of his divine attributes because it was his plan that he would submit and depend upon the Father in the same way that we as believers are to surrender to the Lord and depend upon him to enable us, the spirit in us, to enable us, to empower us. 
Here's the cure for a troubled heart, though. My peace, Jesus says, I give unto you. My shalom, which is wholeness, which is completeness, which is soundness or healthiness. Here is the cure for a troubled heart, for emotions that are wrong, emotions of fear, emotions of, of agitation, emotions of, in, of intimidation. Emotions of being afraid. Here's the cure. My peace give I unto you. It's Jesus's peace. It'll make you whole. It'll make you uh, sound in mind, in heart. By the way, that's another fruit of the spirit, isn't it? There's love. And then there's peace. And then there's a third fruit of the spirit that's mentioned here in the closing verses. I already uh, touched on verse 28, verse 29. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. He's talking about him leaving. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh. That's the devil. And he hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the father. And as the father gave me commandment, even so I do. Here is the third fruit of the Spirit that is produced, and that is faith. That is faith. This is what he's saying. I am equal with God. Different roles. I have voluntarily limited myself by taking on, can you imagine God taking on a human body? That's exactly what Jesus has done. That's exactly who Jesus is. He voluntarily, as God of heaven, limited himself by taking upon himself a human body. And, uh, and yet, he still has the power that we need to live a Christian life. And he still has the power through his spirit. He produces these fruits in our life. Love, peace, we have to believe faith. If you've never received Jesus, then of course, he's not in you. And uh, if he's not in you, the sad truth is that you will be forever separated from him. And you simply need to invite him into your heart and life as your savior from sin. And then he'll come in. He'll cleanse you. He'll save you. He'll live in you. He'll never leave you, as he just said. This whole chapter is about family housing, really. Jesus is going to prepare a house for his people, and God is making your heart his house. Jesus went away to his father's house, but he stayed in the sense that he, he's sending his spirit to live in you and to never leave you. He's in your heart. Your heart becomes Christ's home. Is Christ at home in your heart? How much room have you made for him in your heart? You know, there's a difference between having people stay with you that are strangers versus people stay in your home that are family. Big difference between the two, right? So if you're a believer... Have you made room in your heart for the Lord or is he rather a stranger and he's restricted to just certain parts of your heart? Are there areas in your life that are off limits to the Lord? How much room have you made for him? Are there any secret rooms that you don't want Jesus to go into in your heart? Are there any locked doors or parts of your life that are locked to him. Then I would simply say this, if there are, it's time today for you to take that whole key ring of all the rooms in your heart and hand it over to him and surrender your whole life to him so that you can begin to enjoy the reality of God's presence in you until you hand over all the keys and there's no locked rooms to him. You'll not, no, the presence of God as real 
as he says it can be in that 23rd verse. We will come to him and make our abode with him. The reality of the presence of the Lord in your life is so important. That's the thing that is missing in so many of our lives. The reality, the known, the felt presence of God in our life, that he is real and that he is there. He's with us and we're constantly looking to him, depending upon him to show us what to do, to direct our step this this day, each step of the way, and then to enable us to carry out the direction that he leads us in. We can trust him to do that. Let's pray.